thank you for coming to this first session in the behavior track for the conference. My name is Michelle Hall, and I'm an associate director at the Center for Teaching and Learning at Columbia University. We have four um, speakers um, in this session. We have Dr. Chen from MIT. Um, we have Drew Pollan um, from the University of British Columbia. Did I get that right, Dr. Pollan? Um, Dr. Oh, I'm not going to get your pronounce your name correctly. <laughs> Annie <laughs> from Wesley College, and um, and we have um, um, Oliver from Carnegie Mellon University. I'm sure you're all. I can see from the number of people here that this is a this is a topic that everyone is really interested in. And so um, let's get started. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, can everyone? Hear me fine without the mics? This is a pretty small room. Oh, okay. Okay, it's for the recording. All right. Um, so uh, my name is Chen, and this is a quiz item for my students, <laughs> which is called, uh, this is pronounced as Zhongzhou. Uh, I'm from MIT and working with the Relate Group. Uh, so uh, we work on MOOCs, and uh, to me, MOOCs should be much more than broadcasting the old ways we do in classroom to the internet. Uh, one of the advantages of MOOCs that I believe is that it creates uh, new ways of uh, interacting with the computer and interacting with the course materials. And so one of my fanboys in all, among all the ways of interacting is this uh, drag and drop problem that's built into the edX platform. Um, in short, uh, you have a background image and you define certain targets on your background image. You have a tray of icons and you can drag one of the icons or multiple icons to your targets and the problem is graded on based on that. And so why do I like it so much? I think it has certain uh, potential advantages over the normal multiple choice and dra uh, drop down list problems that we are used to. First of all, it, it reduces extraneous cognitive load um, for example, in this type of problem, a lot of extraneous cognitive load is caused by a uh, so-called split attention effect where you have to uh, match the variables between the problem figure, the equation, and the problem figure, and the uh, choices. And uh, I always joke that physics is written by credit card companies because the most important information are written in the smallest fonts possible. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, so we could design uh, interact uh, drag and drop problems like this, which lets students indicate this is the R that I wanted to use without having to get into the trouble of uh, realizing whether it is R1, R2, or R3, and this is the alpha that I wanted to use in my equation. So it uh, saves some extraneous cognitive load, and it allows for a bigger, more realistic problem space. For example, in this type of problem, um, the, uh, we want students to determine the uh, reference point for the uh, angular momentum expression. And there are four possible points in all, among all 12. And if you wanted to make it into a checkbox question, it's fairly long and uh, fairly terrible, terrible to look at. But it causes a lot of uh, split, split attention extraneous cognitive load. And if you wanted to make it a uh, drag and drop question, you can have the students drag the uh, reference points to wherever they want to put it. And uh, with some modification, you can make it uh, infinitely many targets on this graph. So the problems are more close to the real situation that they will face. And finally, my favorite advantage is that it facilitates memory, which I will show you why. This is one of the problems that we use in our course. Uh, it asks about the direction of angular acceleration and all, all the other. When you finish the problem if, uh, of a drop-down list, you get this. You have to remember alpha is out of the page for B. It, a pretty terrible task to, um, to remember. But it, if you do a drag-and-drop version, your end result will look like this. This is a picture of uh, how the angular acceleration related to the direction of the force and the rotation. And so, according to some cognitive theory, a visual memory of this is a little bit closer to the conceptual understanding itself compared to a language description. So, with these um, advantages and re reduced cognitive loads, 
we think the best use of a drag and drop problem in our course is to construct this series of problems and have students go through them very quickly focused on a single, practicing a single skill, which is the idea of uh, deliberate practice. Uh, so let me explain a little bit about deliberate practice. Deliberate practice, this um, uh, idea came up, with, uh, came up by uh, Erickson, um, which, me, uh, which he claims that uh, deliberate practice is, the f is actually the fastest way to reach expertise in any domain. Uh, if you know the um, learn anything in 20 hours, all those hype talks, they're ab all about deliberate practice. What is deliberate practice? Uh, so I use uh, soccer as, a, uh, as an example or football, some of you may call it. Um, <laughs> so so as, as a football player, soccer player, um, you don't play a full game all the time. In practice, you actually pra focus on practicing one single skill at a time, and you get very specific feedback, uh, instant feedback on the skill you practice. And these practice activities are actually designed by experts to focus on the essential skills uh, that will help you reach expertise. Now. Compare that to a physics problem. Solving a traditional physics problem actually requires a lot of skills, and you don't practice any of them very well. Uh, you just practice all, a bunch of them for a couple of times. So what we wanted to do using drag and drop format is to create a series of those practices, each focusing on practicing one or two of the key skills that students have problem with solving this. We call them deliberate practice activities, and wanted to see if these actually help problem solving. So actually, we're, we, I have two research questions here. One is, does, is drag and drop indeed a better format for conducting these uh, deliberate practice activities, training one simple skills? Can, can I still design those deliberate practice activities in multiple choice or drop down list format? Uh, Will that work? And secondly is, of course, if I practice drag and drop uh, deliberate practice problems, will they be more effective in teaching ac physics expertise compared to solving traditional problems? Um, so how do we find that out? We uh, used the, uh, this great uh, um, feature of the edX platform called AB Experiments, which is basically we split the student population into multiple groups and give them different types of course contents. So in these experiments, we split our uh, student population in three groups. Group A gets the training in uh, traditional physics homework problems. Group B gets the training in multiple choice format, the del uh, deliberate practice activities. And group C uh, uses the um, drag and drop deliberate practice format to practice their physics skills. And to ensure that, uh, well, OK, uh, in the end, we have some common quiz to assess the uh, learning outcomes from these practices. And to ensure fairness between our MOOC students, um, we rotated the uh, treatment and the control between the three groups over the time of three weeks. Now the results. First, I wanted to see if uh, drag and drop format is better than the multiple choice format in developing individual skills. And when I see the data, it looks like this. This is uh, all the uh, deliberate practice problems that we used in one unit. Uh, in the front is the first attempt correct, correct rate, and in the back is the uh, final correct rate on each of the problems. And the point of this graph is to show you the messiness of MOOC data and how lack of pattern there is. So it, it really gave me a big headache when I saw this data. And then I realized something. This is our MOOC population, self-reported education uh, background. Deliberate practice problems, what we developed, were based on our experience with uh, residents, residential students, and they teach the most basic skills. So this is middle school, secondary, a bachelor's, early bachelor's degree is our target population. But we still have this big tail, and according to MOOC research, this big tail are the people who are most likely to continue pursuing a certificate. So our actual population is probably actually like this. How do I find the target population that actually needs those trainings, right? So what I did was that first I focused on this series of, a series of problems that have like five or six questions on the same skill. 
I used the first two, one or two problems as a filter and I said, I only select the population who had difficulty completing these problems. And then I compared their performance on the following problems in the same sequence. And after I did that, my, uh, my population, my N, uh, goes down from big data to small data, unfortunately. But it actually showed a pretty big difference. These are the five sequences of deliberate practice activities. And this is the performance of students in the drag and drop group and the multiple choice group. You see that, uh, uh, well, this is, you can't, these are different sequences, but in these different sequences, the uh, drag and drop actually learned the skills better on the, on the questions afterwards. And if you, and then sometimes you ha the difference is not very significant in the, uh, when, you, when you look at the first attempt, but it becomes bigger when you look at the second attempt. So, so, they, so they still have some difficulty struggling on the first attempt, but they get to correct answers quicker. Um, so this is, this is pretty encouraging, but, uh, and so after a lot of uh, further analysis validating that uh, the populations are actually uh, pretty similar between the two groups, um, we reached the conclusion that pretty likely drag and drop format is a better way of preparing students with these basic skills compared to multiple choice questions. Now, how do these the deliberate practice training compare to traditional problem solving? Well, we use the uh, common quiz and assessment, assessment, and the difference is we don't see a big difference. On average, the traditional problem-solving group did best on a traditional problem-solving quiz. Uh, the multiple choice group did significantly worse, but a little bit, and the drag and drop group is statistically insignificant from the other two groups. So we didn't see a difference. And there are, there are many reasons that uh, contributes to the uh, disappearance of any kind of effect. But I wanted to mention one particular uh, reason, potential reason that we think is, uh, plays an important part in this. For this type of assessment and uh, pre-test, pre and post-test, I would call it, everything happens on one page. The pre-test is the first two problems, the learning process is the whole process, and the post-test is happening on the same page. So it's very likely that students completed the whole assessment in one setting, and they did everything. So, so this is the primary source in which, from which they learned the skill. Compared to this, this experiment design, they have the training here, that's a lot of training containing multiple sequences of this. They have common homeworks to help them practice problem solving. They have common quiz. So this is basically assessing the learning of the whole unit. And there's instructional materials. And what I didn't show is that you have the entire internet in the background. If they couldn't figure something out here, they go Google. And some of our problems are actually Googleable, unfortunately. So, so, it's, so it's a lot of noise in there. And in conclusion, I, I learned two lessons. First of all, to do any data analysis in MOOC, I have to find my sensitive population because the distribution is so wide, anything that I do is probably going to be effective only to a subpopulation of my MOOC students, and I need to, find, and I need to design a way, design, put the design into my curriculum so that later on I can find my target population. And secondly, uh, I'm not very happy with the word localized, but you get my, what, what I wanted to say. So the, the assessment should be closer to your intervention or to, to, to the interesting thing that you want to test, close, as close as possible to eliminate the, all the noise from uh, everywhere else because MOOC students, they really want to get it right. And they have all the resources to do that. Okay, and uh, thank you. Um, welcome for questions. I didn't get any, okay. I'm, Oh, I have five minutes. Great. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, nice talk. Thank you. Oh, um, thank you. So, when you uh, presented the results of comparing whether deliberate practice mm -hmm. uh, is superior to traditional problems, yeah. uh, I, I think the only thing I wasn't sure of is you then went out of your way to explain why you failed to see a difference. Is it? Be are you expecting the difference because prior literature suggests that there should be a difference, or 
Are you open to the possibility that in fact there is no difference? And good, 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 good question. I, I am open to the possibility that there is no difference. However, however, uh, if you read Erickson, deliberate practice is um, a uh, something that has been um, observed in multiple different fields that leads to better expert to expertise. That's a big question in physics still. Uh, I, I'm not aware of anybody who has successfully uh, designed some deliberate practice activities that uh, significantly improves physics uh, or measured physics in improvement in physics expertise. So it could be that uh, the, the idea we didn't implement deliberate practice correctly so that we didn't see a result. Yes. Thank you. But is it, does Erickson's work? stipulate that it's in fact better that I, I don't know what traditional problem solving means okay. when it's you know you're de like a deliberate practice would be you know learning to fix a certain kind of circuit or something right but they're very targeted tasks mm -hmm. so I'm not even sure what the analogy would be comparing traditional problems you know anyway I don't want to take too much off track but I maybe there's yeah. no reason to believe that it will be better right 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 thank you thank you yeah yeah there good point thank you Yeah. And I would find how we can actually use experiments to personalize, how we can use experiments where we start off EV testing mm -hmm. and then the conditions that are better for some subgroup, mm -hmm. we immediately start delivering. Mm -hmm. But you made me realize this is the like flip side of that problem because basically we have a population mm -hmm. and we want to deliver interventions to a subset of them. So the people who you're sensitive the population, in a way, you want to get a drag and drop to a smaller choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, great point. That's my dream. <laughs> um, because, you know, uh, the edX platform, uh, it provides this great uh, AB experiment facility, but uh, I cannot. Uh, I, I do not have control on which population goes into which group. So the, the uh, separation uh, or the group assignment is totally random. I would love to have something. You're talking on the, in, in line of uh, some, some sort of intelligent tutoring system, which, which is basically my, my dream is to, to, to create that. But we're still not there yet. Oh. Oh, great, great, great. We should talk after, the, after this. Thank you. Uh, I guess I have time for one more question. OK. Yeah. Daily practice. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It, it, that is also a, a, a valid possibility. The deliberate practice that we created were focused on some of the fundamentals to solve this that, that are essential for solving those problems. And another possibility is maybe those aren't the skills that, that are causing the difficulties, right? We, maybe we didn't even have the right skills. Um, yes, that, that, that is a good point. Thank you. All right, uh, I think I'm out of time. Thanks to everybody for listening to my talk. And uh, welcome to my talk in this afternoon. <laughs> Advertising. Hi. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out today. My name's uh, Drew Pollan, and uh, I'm from University of British Columbia. I'm here on behalf of uh, Caroline, Leah, and Sarah to uh, discuss a project that we've been working on that really focuses on discussions in MOOCs. 
and, uh, and social network analysis of those discussions. So um, this project is really part of a larger effort at UBC to start looking at MOOC data. I think, um, and maybe you guys have something similar uh, where, where you guys are, um, we really put a lot of resources into developing and delivering uh, MOOCs, and so now we feel it's time to really start put re putting resources into understanding our MOOCs and really understanding the learning experiences that uh, you know our students are having and, and the design of these courses. Um, and so really, you know, I think this is sort of a, an exploratory uh, step uh, in that direction. So, you know, what we do is we take a, a network perspective and we look at how discussion in the courses may be, might be affecting learning, might be fostering some conditions that we think are important for learning. So that's really the underpinning of, uh, of you know, the impetus of, of why we're doing this work. And what we're trying to actually do with the work is, as I said, it's, it's quite exploratory. We're trying to, deter to determine an effective set of procedures and methods to understand social networks and social learning that, uh, that could occur in, in MOOCs. I mean, you know, we're wondering questions like, uh, do learning communities form in MOOCs? And maybe, you know, how, do they, how, do, how does that formation occur? And what can we do to, to foster learning communities and engagement um, in our MOOCs? Uh, specifically, of course, I'm talking about, you know, the dis discussion forums in MOOCs. Um, and, you know, I think when we talk about social network analysis and its relation to um, both sort of designing the courses as well as delivering the courses, like how we interact with our students, um, you know, the idea is to understand how social network analysis and the feedback that we can give to the instructors and, and the designers of these courses and how we can actually work in a collaborative way with the people developing and de delivering their courses so that we can, you know, try to optimize what they do and, and, and try to get, you know, optimization in terms of what students are able to do in, in their courses. Um, and so, you know, for me, I think a lot of it has to do with do the interaction patterns that we see in, in the discussion match with instructor expectations uh, and their pedagogical goals? And, and you know, if, if that is the case, what can we do to further support that? And if it's not the case, then we can sort of take a step back and figure out what they're doing in terms of scaffolding and interaction with their students to actually get them where they go. And actually, a lot of it has to do with just having those sort of conversations with instructors and course designers. You know, how does discussion actually play into your design intent of your course? So I think there's this, you know, really strong relationship, for me at least, um, between the sort of learning analytics that, that can happen and the learning design that, that can happen uh, around MOOCs. So um, the focus of, of the study was really on uh, initial offerings of, of two edX courses at UBC. Uh, the first one is uh, Water 201X, which was titled Water is the New Green. The other one was Chinese Thought, Ancient Wisdom Meets Modern Science. Um, you know, obviously the, the courses, the first course is, is the one that we're going to focus on today just because there's just so much data to go through, so uh, just one course at a time. But, you know, water in the, is the new green is really about, you know, water usage and sustainability and, and ideas around that and using actually like real, real world examples there. And then Chinese thought is really about Chinese philosophy and, and trying to take like an everyday approach to seeing how that fits into people's lives. Um, and we focus solely on, on discussion forum data. Um, and we also included interviews with the course design lead for both courses. Uh, and what we really did was um, we did some social network analysis and some text analysis on discussion data for both courses. I'm going to focus mostly on, on the social network analysis and leave most of the text analysis for, you know, another paper, another presentation. <laughs> so uh, as I said, we're really only going to be looking at the water course today. So <clears throat> let's talk about some of the key questions that we have when we use social network analysis to examine learning contexts. So when we use a, a network perspective, it allows us to see how knowledge is being co-constructed through discussion. And it allows us to discover how online participants are really connected to each other. And you know, what we're interested in understanding is who's talking to whom, and then you know, when you bring in sort of the, the more text analysis, you're also sort of focused on what it is that they're actually talking about. So social network, network analysis allows us to judge whether the communication networks formed as part of the class can effectively support processes that uh, we feel uh, contribute to successful learning. So things like information sharing, community building, and, and collaboration. And so, you know, I think social network analysis really allows us to sort of ask, are those sorts of things happening? Um, you know, is there, is there some sort of evidence that we can dig further into to sort of find those things happening? And the other thing is that social network analysis really allows us to work both on the individual level, so like egocentric 
um, networks, which is really looking at, at the individual and sort of where they sit in the network, what information they're exposed to, what sort of role they might play in the network, as well as more of like a macro view, a network wide level to sort of get some of those characteristics about networks um, and sort of communication patterns within the network that are, that are likely for the people involved in that network. So that's really, um, I think, what we think about when we talk about SNA and learning. So um, to understand the networks that emerge in discussions, we really use two types of networks. So the first one is uh, a name network, which is, which is really about who mentions whom. So we're looking for actual names. Um, and the second one is chain networks. And this is really focuses, focusing on who replies to whom. So what we're talking about is nodes, is the sort of users, and then these are the two ways that the nodes are actually connected, right? The who mentions whom in the name network is how those nodes are connected, and who replies to whom is how they're connected in the chain network. Um, once we have the networks discovered, we use social network analysis to make sense of those emerging connections uh, amongst the, the participants. And as I said, we can look at both micro and macro level measures to examine the interactions in class. So the micro level uh, measures really help us uh, you know, figure out and it provides insight for individuals. Uh, whereas macro is really more about the overall state of the network. So when we talk about micro level measures, um, you know, they're really all centrality measures. And so that's what we're focusing on. Um, and, and it helps us to understand sort of nodes, right? Node size is determined by these centrality measures and the position within the network is determined by the centrality of the node. So um, the centrality of the nodes, uh, that's, you know, the, the people who you're connected to in the network is actually going to determine your positioning in that network. And so the nodes that you're not connected to also have an influence on your position in, or a node's position in the network. So centrality really allows us to determine the most connected members in the class and shows who's influencing information flow. And, you know, if we actually take a, a deeper dive into the types of interactions they're having, maybe we get a sense of tone and sociability of the discussions that take place um, because the major actors are, are sort of almost setting that tone, right? So we have in degree, which is when, uh, when you're mentioned or, or replied to by others, so sort of incoming uh, connections. And then you have out degree, which is, when, is basically your activity. So when you're mentioning or replying to others. And so, you know, you can think of in degree as kind of prestige or popularity. So for instance, like if you do, I've done sort of um, Twitter uh, analysis at conferences and you know, keynote speakers and sort of big names in, in the community are, always have a really high uh, in degree because they're constantly being mentioned, right? Um, whereas out degree is really about the people who are sitting there tweeting every second word um, because they're just, they're really you know, active in the network. So that should give you an idea of, of those, those two sort of centrality measures. Um, <clears throat> So I think too, it, it also helps us understanding, uh, you know, if clusters are forming, uh, if certain people are active, like if you're interested in understanding how active your TA was in the course, and maybe perhaps if they're too involved, um, or you know, maybe uh, centrality measures are a good way to understand or, or to sort of a, a, a starting point for who might be good candidates for community TA roles in, in, the, in the discussion forums and so on. So anyways, um, maybe let's have a look at, at, the, at the networks, the, the name and chain networks for uh, the water MOOC. So here we see the, the name network, and this is actually using a layout algorithm uh, called fruchter Rheingold, which is, uh, it shows all the nodes in the network. And you can see there's a lot of sort of island nodes, right? Just sort of these um, <clears throat> single points that aren't really connected. And you know, this is pretty common in a lot of networks, but I would say it's probably really common in MOOC networks. And, and you know, it gives us a sense of what, what's actually happening in, in MOOCs in terms of attrition and retention and, and how forum participation beyond you know, single posts or, or limited posts um, is actually quite limited when you actually look at you know, what happens over the span of, of the course in terms of discussions. So, and this is important because um, the island nodes really do affect the centrality of the network. Uh, you can see the most of the sort of highly connected nodes are actually off-center. They're not in the, the center of the diagram. So um, within this network, there were 497 unique participants and two, uh, 2,403 comments uh, in total. So uh, 497 people who posted it at least once. And so the unconnected nodes represent single users' posts that didn't include any other names, because this is the name network. And you'll see the impact of, of all these sort of absent or island nodes uh, when we talk about macro network uh, measures.
So yeah, the attrition really did happen quickly. So here's just a, some descriptive stats about um, posts. And we see uh, posts by date. Um, there's lots of activity at the beginning that really quickly trails off. Um, and so just to summarize the activity in terms of posts, the two instructors, the instructor and the TA, posted 31% of all the comments and, and threads. Um, there were 159 regularly contributing stu students, and they posted 32% of all the threads. And then the remaining 336 students posted the remaining 37% of threads. So, you know, I think in terms of, it's really dominated by, by the TA, quite honestly, uh, as, as we'll see. And um, here are the replies per thread, and again, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty low. Most threads didn't have a lot of replies on average. The, the, the reply on average for all threads was 4.29, and that's, um, there's also just like, you know, an intro thread that's uh, 200 um, posts. And there were 454 comment threads total. So um, a lot of it actually took place in, in the first, you know, few little while, I guess the first week, but um, all the introductory threads. Because not only was that one sort of 200 post introductory thread, but there were people who, um, oops, who, you know, posted, you know, hi, they just did, they, they created their own thread rather than, you know, posting in the existing one. So if we remove those introductory threads, we're left with 211 threads, and the, the, the average reply goes up a little bit, 5.67. That also removes the, the outlier of, of that 200 post uh, thread. So, um, so some descriptive stats that inform the network. We see lots of attrition quickly, uh, not too many threads with a whole lot of posts. Most of the activity in the course actually were in 18 threads, um, and that's where really I think the bulk of the discussion happened around course topics. So there were 18 of these threads with 10 or more posts. The most popular thread was the discussion around calculating your water footprint. Oh, I didn't mention, these are actually pretty small MOOCs, I think, in terms of numbers. Um, I, I think both of them had less than 1,000 uh, students in them. And, and uh, this one and the other one, they both had around 500 unique participants in the discussion forum. So not really huge compared to a lot of MOOCs that are out there. All right, so here's the same network, a, a name network using a different uh, layout algorithm that really focuses on the connected users. And you can see that, you know, it was dominated by one user. This is the TA, um, the large blue node. And the second one, the second node is the instructor. So, um, so the color coding, it's automatically determined by a community detecting algorithm. And it really just, just sort of uh, understands the, uh, uh, it automatically assigns colors uh, to nodes that are more likely to be connected to each other. So we do see a few different clusters emerge. There is lots of low overlap, but I think the real takeaway here is that um, the network really revolves around highly active, high, highly central users, um, but there's not really break off separate groups. <clears throat> All right, here's the chain network. It's a lot more dense um, than the name network. Um, and I think it's, it really actually says a lot about how the algorithm in Netlic, Netlitic reads the network from the discussion structure. Um, so the replies are connected to the thread starter, and that really amplifies the centrality of the TA in this case, and, and makes it, you know, m probably a bit more uh, uh, connected than, than it perhaps was, just because of the way the algorithm works. I'm just going to move through here because I'm kind of running out of time. So here are the most active participants in terms of centrality and, and, and posts. So the first one's sorted by post count. Uh, and then name network centrality, and then chain network centrality. And the reason why I, showed, I wanted to show this is just to show that, um, you know, it's not always the same, the order is different, but really it's the, it's the TA and the instructor who are, who are running this show here. Um, and I think what's interesting here is that just being active in terms of posts doesn't always translate to high centrality. In terms of name network, high end degree can happen, you know, by lots of mentions, for example. So I think... Um, means that people who are talking were also being responded to because the in-degree and out-degree are, are pretty even in a lot of cases, especially, um, you know, in, in the instructional team's cases. So uh, there's a lot of back and forth going on, um, but it can also indicate that the, the discussion was actually being directed at them, like the DA and the instructor, rather than distributed amongst the students well. And actually that was confirmed in the, uh, in the interview with the course design lead, that there, there was some... Uh, you know, they, they, they didn't, they wanted to move away from, from that. So that, there was actually some changes in the second iteration. <laughs> so, okay, um, here's some network properties. I'm just going to go through these quickly. Density is really the overall connectivity, connectivity of the network, and diameter is the distance between the farthest nodes in the network, so basically how far information has to travel, and obviously those two are, are very, very much connected. Reciprocity is a measure of, you know, how connected, uh, sorry, how, how bimodal are, are the connections. 
Um, centralization is just an, uh, an idea of, of you know, how centralized the network is. Is it really distributed or is it tightly knit amongst uh, you know, highly centralized nodes? And then modularity is, is really um, do, do individuals sort of participate across a number of different sort of clusters or, or do they all sort of keep them themselves? And that's really um, the, the macro measures. And so here we see the, uh, the network properties for um, the water MOOC. And so the diameter, it's the uh, longest path between any two nodes in the network is 10 and 16. It's not very wide, um, and so it's highly connected. Um, the chain network is, is three times more dense than the name network, but it's, remembered that to, it's important to remember that they actually have less than 1% of possible connections. So we can attribute this to the high number of, of island nodes, I think, those that posted once and then dropped out. Um, it's also tough to interpret uh, density as it's dependent on the number of nodes, and it's difficult to maintain connections uh, amongst uh, a really large network. So reciprocity, reciprocity shows how many online participants are having two-way conversations. Um, we see that they're pre pretty similar across both networks, and it's actually pretty high for networks of this size, because, uh, you know, again, lots of island nodes. So 30% of the ties are reciprocal, and I think we can attribute this largely to those introduction threads, where the TA was really active in responding to students. Um, so beyond that, I think though there were some good examples of, of you know, students posting questions and getting into discussions with others. So I think in terms of quality dialogue, um, it's there, and the reciprocity sort of shows that. Um, but I think it just wasn't there in, in quite enough quantity for, for the instructional team to sort of be happy with it. Um, so centralization, this one actually really surprised me because you'd think it would be really high given the disparity between the centrality measures of, of the TA and the instructor, but they aren't really that high for a network this size. And I think, you know, once again, it's those absent nodes just throwing things off. Um, and if we remove the majority of the nodes that aren't posted once, they actually go up, the, the name goes up to 37% and the chain goes to 42, which is actually pretty high compared to other networks of size. All right, I'm done. Thank you very much, it took too much time. I'm happy to answer questions if there is no time. We can take just two short questions. You're out of time, but I want to give you a chance. <laughs> Thanks, sorry. Yes. Yeah, and you know, I think it's it's pretty important to say that um, it's almost like a disclaimer to say that that one's not directly translated to the other. It's it's tough to actually measure learning by looking at this. But what we do look at is sort of information flow, um, and we so we understand what what information people have access to and what information um, they can contribute. And so I think you know there are there are certain. There are certain uh, structures that are, are more beneficial uh, than others, and, there, and I think really it's not, that's actually not a good way to say it. I think it's, it's really about looking at the, the design intent, the pedagogical intent. How does discussion, how do you want discussion to fit into your course? And this, looking at some of these, these sort of network, um, you know, it, it really gives you an idea of whether or not that's happening. So, you know, I think, um, you know, this is a good example of how TAs are, are talking amongst a bunch of different clusters, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a better tool to sort of uh, measure against pedagogical intent. So did you uh, do any exploration of learning outcomes vis-a-vis -vis how they were talking to each other, like what kind of structures they were talking about? Uh, not really. I mean, we did, we did jump into some, some basic text analysis and basically doing categorization of words used so we can understand, you know, what they talked about um, but, uh, and, and when. Um, but I think, you know, we didn't include any performance um, or, 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 or uh, data, and I think that's definitely some next steps. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, first, welcome for coming to our session today. My name is Amy Mustafarai. I'm from... Wellesley College, which is a liberal arts college in nearby state of Massachusetts, a small private liberal arts college. I'm an assistant professor of computer science there. I hope to have time for two parts in this talk to talk a little bit about some research that I've done with uh, my undergrad students. They are uh, working with MOOC data, mostly 
click streams and trying to visualize them in order to understand whether we can find out how people learn. That's a big question. And also try to discuss with you this idea of can we do research when we only have partial data. So I will go briefly over this because George Siemens in the morning did a very good job at explaining to all of us why people are still caring about MOOCs. There, is, there are people who care about access and broadening access and scale issues. A lot of people care about experimenting, like our friend Chen here um, showed before, um, ideas of new technologies and new learning and flipped classrooms and all this stuff. But mostly for people like me, computer scientists, we were drawn to MOOCs because of the data. We just love data and, you know, what better way to do things when there's MOOCs data there. However, we have to specify what kind of data because different people talk about different data, right? If you are an instructor or students, then you care about the metrics of the course, right? Um, how many people accessed that resource? How many people completed the homework, um, watched the video and so on? But if you're a researcher or a developer at the level of the um, frameworks and infrastructure, then probably you want to look at low level data. And the lowest level data here are the clicks, right? This is what are we are able to capture when the students participate in this environment. So frameworks like uh, platforms like edX and I'm sure the other uh, platforms as well already have tools like edX Insights. We actually um, uh, saw that in Chen's talk as well that uh, you can use a platform like this if you are in the instructor of the course or the developer of the course, you go on edX Insights and you are able to see and answer questions like, let me take this, uh, who are my students, where they are in the world, whether they are engaging with the content, how can I support them and so on. So some examples here, the big picture is I can look at the entire semester, 12 weeks here, and I can look at the video content that the course had and then say, okay, that's the percentage of the people who watched the entire material and some other people who didn't watch that, but then I have a very good overview of what happened with the content that I provided. And also I'm able to zoom in in a particular material, maybe just one video, and analyze, well, who watched the video or whether they were able to complete it, but also see replay actions in video when the student pause the video and then play it again or go back and forth and so on. And some people at MIT and edX have been using these particular graphs and analysis in order to improve video editing or other video um, uh, you know, uh, techniques for actually creating videos, right? You know, or you go and analyze what's happening in these peaks and then you maybe figure out that the transition between the slides were not uh, good and so you have to think now doing better editing or allowing people more time between these. So the idea is that once you have data like this, this high level data, what you want to do is to answer this question like, how well are students in my course doing, right? And eventually if I have on my instructor head and you know, I'm also an instructor at my institution, I would say, okay, so I have all this data and then this is not data from a course that I've taught. This is a course at MIT, which actually was the first MITx course that started edX in fall of 2012. It was um, a huge course, about 100,000 students enrolled in it. And I happen to have access to the user tracking database. And the results that I'm gonna show later are related to that database. But anyway, if I were the instructor of the course, then I would care about the fact that, hey, I provided all these questions and problems to assess student learning, and then I see what they did with that, that content, and eventually I can use that database to go and see statistics like, okay, there were 4.4 million uh, attempts to these problems, and, you know, 
basically half of the students who enrolled for the course actually tried one of these activities and a very small number actually attempted to do the larger portion of the content that are provided for assessment, right? Um, however, though, I'm not the instructor, so I'll take the instructor head off and I say, as someone who's just purely uh, curious about what happens when we're learning or when students are learning, I just want to see whether we can use this data that the MOOCs are collected, collecting in order to answer this question, right? Okay, so what that means is that we have to go to a low level, we have to go to the clicks, okay? And I don't know how many of you have access to user tracking databases, but basically the clicks look like this, right? There is a bunch of data points that are probably not as interesting because they are repeating, but eventually here I might care about the event type. In this, uh, in this case, it's just the landing page and the timestamp. So, and then I can go on and look at other uh, click types. This is a play video event. And in this case, I have more information. I know to, in which page this video appears. I know the title of the video. This happens to be the YouTube code. If you go to YouTube and search for that, that's the video where the student started. And then there is this interesting fact about the speed with which you're watching the video, right? And this particular student is at speed 0 0.75. And so, you know, if you have ever done MOOCs, uh, sometimes we go to 1.5 or 2 because we think that the instructor is going too slow, right? And then eventually there are students who need to actually slow down. A and here is one of these hypotheses you can say like, okay, why would be the case that the student would want that? And then the IP address might help you with that. You can kind of do a reverse lookup of the IP address. And it turns out that this particular student is not a native speaker. So for him, maybe, or her, it was actually important just to slow down in order to understand what was going on. Uh, we have more clicks. And so depending on what the students are doing, these clicks actually incorporate basically the state of the browser in the moment that the user submitted something, right? In this case, they actually tried to solve the problem. Uh, we even have their information about whether it was correct or not, how, the number of attempts, what answer they had, and so on. So when you look at the clicks separately, right, you can come up with those statistics that we just mentioned, like how many people watched the video, how many people attempted, and so on. However, you know, for all people who have done web analytics, you know that what is important is, you know, the, the, the whole stream, right, and the sequence of qu uh, clicks, what you're doing next, next, and so on. And so basically here is one of those examples that, um, was happening a lot in the data set that I had is this, you land in that page and then you have to navigate for two or three or four links until you find the content you want, right? So basically you're spending like 30 seconds only to trying to find where to go. Um, in the meantime, edX has fixed this, right? So this is one of those cases that you can use these data and if you are a user um, design experience person, you say, oh, there is something wrong here. And the fix that they did is that now they remember the last time where you visited the course, where you were, and so that when you go next time, you don't need to navigate, it just, just lands you directly where you left last time and it actually asks you, you were here, do you want to stay here or go somewhere else? Now, let us look at you know, more of these clicks, right? I, I just show you a, a small example, but usually for a user, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of these clicks one after the other. Okay, so for your, for better to see this, I change the timestamps into a readable format for humans, so there is a date and there is the, the hour time. And eventually this is that event type that we saw, right? And if we look at this, we can see that, you know, the student started at 3 uh, p.m. and then it's 
still continuing at 4 p.m. And it's doing some things here, but it's hard to see because of these URLs that are kind of very long. And so the next step that we did when we were looking at this data said, well, let's add some more meaning to what, what's going on in here. Um, one that is common in people who do research with learning data is time spent on a task. And usually calculate time spent on something just by taking you know, the difference in two consecutive steps, right? So between 307, 307, 50, there are 20 seconds that I spend there and I go like that down. Right? That was one step. And the other was, okay, these URLs, they mean something. Let's find the, the, what is that they mean. For example, here I'm trying, or I am in a page where there's something with a problem, or here I'm some discussion. So eventually I create like higher level categories and, and deal with them. And once I do this, automatically for the data, then I can go to the next step and say, I can visualize this because it's better looking at graphs than at numbers in a spreadsheet. And so eventually that one or two hours that we had in the spreadsheet, we can, and those categories that we use, we can look at the user spend some time here, then problem, then back here and forth. And also we can see the number of clicks, which then can show whether the user was active or not. And now we see here that problem with the time spent in a task, because there are periods in which the user eventually is not clicking, right? And I don't know what's going on because there are, I have no other ways for, for me to figure out that. However, if I go and just look at this data again, something very interesting was happening in here. So. I mean, the first time that the user landed somewhere meaningful was a thread. And, you know, look at the last three digits or so just to remember it. But basically a thread in the edX forum is a question. So somebody asks a question and uh, in the the database, uh, a new thread is created. And so eventually this person is reading a thread, which is a question, and after some back and forth, eventually, maybe 40 minutes or so later, decides to reply to that question, right? So eventually, in the meantime, did something else, maybe just um, learned something that he needed or looked up stuff in order to, have to, to go and answer that question, but eventually replied to the question. But then immediately after that, um, so once you create, um, what, once you answer to something, it, it becomes a comment to the thread and it takes an idea on its own. But basically this user now, it's performing some operation which is like updating the comment, eventually deleting that comment because maybe it's not happy with it, replying again, then deleting again. And so you go, goes back and forth between these, right? And then eventually then now our visualization before wasn't able to capture these actions that were happening in there, but that might be um, evidence of something, right? There is this famous saying from Herb Simon, uh, learning results from that the student does and things. Now we cannot see what the students are thinking but with MOOCs, actually, we can capture what they're doing, right? And we saw a sequence of things that the student did. Now, the same student, this is, um, once we had this data, we said, well, let's visualize the whole of it. And um, this is, the semester, I think, was from October 1st to January um, 20th. And these are the 24 hours of the day. So basically, the user is sleeping here, and then that's the rest of the time in which he logs in and spends time on the course. The red one is this, uh, the interval that we just saw. So this user was very active in this course, right? And, and we can do this for all users if we want. So the, here's a user who started actually very active and then dropped the course, right? And Remember when we talk about drop-offs in MOOCs, right? But they might look like this. Somebody who was very engaged initially and then something happened and they just drop. Or they might look like this, okay? This guy actually ended the course, right? Participated in the final exam and maybe took a certificate or so on. But he's a very different learner from the ones that we saw before. Maybe he had pre-existing knowledge and so on. But I mean, I might can call him a binge learner or something, okay? 
Um, so to go back, this data is useful. It allows us to create this visualization. And this visualization might help us look at two different questions, you know, what kind of learner types are out there, but also in terms of learner strategies on how they approach learning in general. So we, we want to look at many of these sessions that, that users had. And for example, here is just a short, maybe 12 minute book reading session. How do we know? Well, because uh, we know that there is a book event. Eventually at the beginning, there are a lot of clicks, which means that you are going to try to find the page when you want to start reading, right? Like next, 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 next page. And then once you find the page, your pace or clicks is like one per minute or so on. And then you're done with reading and then, you know, do something else. But that was just one session, right? There are people who just sit and read the book for 15 minutes. Um, this is a video watching session, okay? And this is one of the video watching sessions that seems to be kind of very active because there are lots of clicks all the time. So this person, student, is not just watching the video passively and you know not engaging. He is just pausing and clicking and going back and forth all the time, right? Maybe taking notes or trying to do something else. But anyway, he is paying attention here. And this is goes like for 50 minutes, right? So when we say about, hey, learners, six minutes have their attention, well, maybe not all of them, okay? Or a homework session when people are going back and forth between the discussion forum and the uh, and the problem solving. So that helps with the um, the social aspect. Now. I ended with my presentation part, and what I wanted to talk about very briefly, and we can do that later if you're interested, but there are certain implementation issues to this, which I'll probably not go about, but these are what makes difficult um, automatically dealing with um, these uh, learning sessions. But I'm a computer scientist and I don't know much about learning science. And so eventually I look at these and I, myself, I'm not able to come up with theories or hypotheses what's happening in here. Is there any learning happening or not? And so uh, a reason for coming to a workshop like this is to say like, hey, this is what I'm doing. Are there people out there that are interested in, in talking to us about what's happening there? But the other has to do with the fact that I was not involved with the people who run the course. So the only data that I got was that user tracking database. I don't have the demographics data. I don't know who these people are, right? And all the kinds of analysis that other people do, and I'm ending it here, uh, is that you, you try to find some um, causation or correlation, right, between, you know, these people have this background and demographics, and this is how they're doing the course, right? I don't have them here, and I want to know, is it possible to find something meaningful, even if I don't have those variables that everyone else wants to have? Have when they are building models. That's it. Thank you so much for your attention. Yes, please. Quick, quick question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned learning styles. Um, if you do this again, would you like to send your students a survey to identify what kind of learning styles are preferential? For the different students. And then another question is how do you teach the course? Are you addressing it, focusing on a particular learning style? Yeah. Your method of but then you go back to my question about how can I do research if I'm not involved with the course, right? Because both of those presume that I I have something to do with the course and I don't, right? So does it mean that only the people who are teaching MOOCs can participate in the MOOC research? Or can other people as well who just have access to partial data and also don't have control over how the course is executed and run? Or we create establish these relationships before a course exactly. is on. Is yes. there a way to automatically send out types of surveys like that to help um, give more um, yes. meaning to the data? Yeah. But then we also don't know when it comes to online learning what the learning types are, right? Are there the same learning types that we talked about when we're doing different learning without online support? 
So that, that would be another question. But thank you so much, and I'm sorry. I'm from the Language Technologies Institute at CMU, and the work I'm presenting today is joint work with uh, my colleagues Mia Mia Wen and Carolyn Rosé. The title of my talk is very long, but I can make it much more uh, much more concise, and uh, that's how can we make MOOCs more social? The recent focus of our groups at CMU is probably what, uh, what, what many of you are doing right now, and that's thinking about the future of the MOOC. And we thought a lot about the delta between the high expectations uh, of MOOCs in 2011 and 2012 and what MOOCs actually delivered in the end, what MOOCs are today. And as most, most of you will probably agree, this delta is pretty big. And a key aspect that's still lacking uh, in today's MOOCs, at least in most of them, is social support and real collaborative learning. We therefore want to build affordances that bridge this gap and bring MOOCs closer to what they actually can be and what they were expected to be. With our work, we want to enable project and problem-based learning as well as collaborative reflection and collaborative problem solving in MOOCs. Um, and we want to foster community building and social support, which uh, is supposed to reduce attrition in these courses and also engage underrepresented students in online education. Overall, we want MOOCs to be more like gateways to enduring communities of, uh, of practice rather the, than these self-contained short-term uh, courses they are right now. Our previous work has shown that there is evidence in MOOC data of associations between different types of conversational interactions and aspects such as retention and attrition, uh, teamwork quality, and learning. Based on uh, this theoretical foundation, we aim to design interventions that have a positive impact on real-world uh, real MOOCs today. And in this talk today, I'm going to present three, uh, three uh, studies and the findings of these studies um, related to the broad vision of designing discussion affordances for collaborative learning in MOOCs. In order to involve a broader community of practitioners, researchers, and policymakers, basically all of you uh, here at this uh, workshop, we formed a working group around these goals, which is called DANCE, and you're all invited to participate. I will show the URL uh, at the end of this talk again. So I will start with an introduction of two particular MOOC interventions that we integrated in an edX MOOC we ran last year. Uh, Bazaar, and uh, George briefly mentioned that this morning, is an, uh, a system for collaborative chat that supports uh, synchronous uh, collaborative reflection. It's supported by a conversational agent, a computer program that participates and scaffold in the discussion and scaffolds it. Uh, the Quick Helper will be the second intervention, uh, is a social recommendation in engine that supports help, help exchange in MOOC in particular in the MOOC forums. So uh, to give you some background uh, about the uh, context in which these interventions uh, um, were placed, um, uh, let me just introduce the MOOC we, uh, we used to, um, to deploy these, uh, these studies. Um, the MOOC was called Data Analytics uh, and Learning, in short, DAL MOOC, and we ran that uh, between October and December last year, together with George Siemens, Dragan Gasevich, and Ryan Baker. And it was uh, not your typical edX MOOC, but a dual-layer MOOC, which is a combination of a connectivist approach that's more open around learning goals and not so much about individual uh, learning materials, but it also had an, uh, a, a classic X MOOC layer in it. So let's now have a look at our Bazaar intervention. Bazaar is a platform for group chats that's facilitated by uh, conversational agents. And it was integrated in, the, in Dalmuk as an assignment uh, within each course segment. So uh, Dalmuk had different uh, topics uh, each week, um, which correlated to, um, which, which corresponded to different segments. And as a first st step towards synchronous activities in MOOCs, you usually have asynchronous interactions in MOOCs. And we decided to form discussion pairs rather than larger groups because uh, they were easier to manage. These pairs were formed ad hoc, uh, bringing together random users who came to a, a waiting room, a lobby platform, and then were matched with a chat partner. 
And that's what they saw once they got matched. They entered their private chat room and a conversational agent joined to scaffold the discussion. Uh, every, uh, every section, every, um, every week of the course had its own link to its own um, chat room setup. And the agent um, is basically a computer program that acts as a regular user in the discussion and prompts the students to reflect on several aspects of the weekly topic. We carried out a survival analysis post hoc on the data from the first six weeks of the course to see whether the participation in this intervention, in this chat um, activity, had, a, had an impact on dropout. And we looked at two day periods during the first week of the course and found that a successful participation in the chat at, at one time point cut the dropout probability at the next point, uh, time point more, in more than half. However, there's a caveat to that. Unfortunately, it was sometimes difficult to actually find a chat partner because there were times where there was no critical mass, mass uh, um, uh, locked in the course that wanted to do the, uh, the chat activity. So uh, students who needed uh, too many tries to find a chat partner got frustrated and this increased the dropout uh, rate uh, drastically again. So this is where we have to uh, improve in the future. Beyond measuring the impact on chat, chat drop, uh, of chat on dropout, we were also interested in what actually happened in the chats and how the chats in, chat interaction compared to conversations on other platforms, such as Twitter and the integrated uh, MOOC forums. Uh, we coded a sample of messages from each of these platforms, Twitter, the forums, and our chats, along two dimensions. One dimension was what the message, what a single message was about, about, a social, about social aspects such as why are, you, uh, why are you in this course, what's your background, about course procedures like where can I find material for, uh, for week two and when is the next assignment due, and course content which is, which is actually about the topic of the course, uh, learning analytics. The second dimension was the amount of reasoning exhibited in, uh, in a uh, posted message. And both Twitter discussions and synchronous chat so, uh, sh showed a significantly higher concentration of on-task discussions than the forum, which was primarily used to discuss course procedures uh, and technical issues in our course. I know that there are courses that have a, a much higher percentage of actually on-task and on-topic uh, discussions in the forums as well. Um, but what we really um, like to see was that the chat activity had overall the uh, highest concentration of reasoning, which is actually what we wanted to elicit in, um, in, in these activities, that they actually thought about um, the topic of the week and reflected on what they had learned. Let me now briefly introduce the second interventions we um, ran in this MOOC, which is called the Quick Helper. It was integrated in the edX discussion forum and recommended fellow students to help seekers to answer their question. The idea was basically if someone has a, had a question, we wanted to give them um, a list of people who we thought would be the best people to answer this question. So students would just submit their uh, post, their question uh, as a regular uh, post to the forum. But uh, before submitting and showing the uh, post in the forum, they would be presented with uh, a pop-up window that looks like this, where our recommendation system showed a list of uh, three people uh, who, we, uh, who the um, um, machine learning model that we trained on the forum data uh, decided to be the best choices to answer that particular question. And the user, uh, the student, had the opportunity to select any number of um, th these three students, and they would be notified of this question um, by email with a link to participate in the forum, but the question would be posted uh, as a regular post to the forum so anybody could actually reply to it. Um, we found that the Quick Helper usage uh, increased significantly over time during the runtime of the, of the whole MOOC. So it was not just a novelty effect that students used this in the beginning a lot and then they just um, uh, didn't care anymore. Uh, the usage, uh, the frequency uh, that the Quick Helper was used increased over time. Overall, the probability of getting a reply in the forum was 81% and we haven't yet compared this to a control group and we really have to 
uh, check whether the quick helper made the uh, threat resolution more um, effective. Now to the third topic of this talk, and this is really um, um, very, uh, th these are very recent results that we didn't really know we would have when we submitted the abstract to this workshop, but um, I'm happy that I have something uh, positive to report. So we have just seen that in the case of Bazaar, the sh uh, short-term group interventions have a positive effect on retention. So the dropout, uh, the dro dropout probability um, dro um, decreased uh, when students um, when students took part in this chat. And there are also team-based MOOCs like NovoEd that are uh, more focused on group work and rely on team interactions throughout the whole course. And related work has, has shown that these courses overall have uh, lower ra attrition rates than standard regular MOOCs that are not uh, centered around uh, these teams. So it seems like teams are the solutions, uh, solution to uh, drop out in MOOCs. However, when we actually look at how effectively these teams collaborate, and we have looked at two particular NovoEd courses um, that ran recently and we got the data sets from, we found that they largely fail in their actual teamwork, even though they persist until the end of the course and as the members stay active until the end of the course. So measured on their final course projects, most of these teams that uh, we looked at in these two courses didn't do very well. Very well. So an important question, therefore, is how we can assist the formation of effective teams and not just um, form teams so students stay in the course without um, them being more effective and um, successful than others. Uh, the idea is to start with community-level tasks before forming the actual teams instead of uh, starting with the team formation right away, as, uh, as, it, as it is the case in NovoEd. And this counteracts the homophily effect, which basically means that the same, uh, that people cling to people that are like themselves, and which reduces the, uh, the, the breadth of uh, point, uh, points of view reflected in a, in, a, um, in a team and also the resources that actually uh, are available in a team. And there's less social pressure in this, um, in this community level interaction in the beginning. So um, the shy students, uh, tend to uh, participate more than in a small team. Uh, secondly, we use community engagement of the individual students in the community level interactions as uh, evidence of who might work well together in a team later. And, and in particular, we look at transactive reasoning in these interactions. We chose uh, Mechanical Turk as an experimental platform for our initial uh, experiments, and this allows us an experimental design with higher internal validity and has successfully been applied in the MOOC context before uh, by, uh, in related work. And this further enabled us uh, to uh, have a more rapid iterative design. So we ran many, many pilot studies with different setups which wouldn't have been able in an actual MOOC context. In particular, we explored two uh, research questions in two separate experiments. First, we wanted to explore whether exposure to large community discussions actually leads to more success successful team collaboration. And secondly, whether evidence of transactive discussion during the deliberation phase in the, uh, on the community level uh, leads to more successful teams. Uh, a brief, uh, as a brief background, uh, let me give you a description of the task that we used to uh, explore these research questions. The task at hand was a constraint satisfaction proposal writing task. Basically, students got a, a certain uh, number of constraints that they had to uh, keep in mind when solving a problem and collaboratively writing about their solution. A team had to, um, a team had to come up with a plan for a municipal energy supply. And each team member received information about a specific energy source. So that's your um, traditional jigsaw paradigm. And the whole team then had to compile a plan that weighed the pros and cons of each option and propose a single solution while taking into account the uh, constraints like, um, like how much money was available and these kind of things. Uh, the task was split in four uh, phases. First, um, the individual preparation, where each of the students got their background materials and had to read through them, answer a quiz about them, 
and a pre-task where they had to write a proposal for the individual energy source. Then the deliberation phase, phase that happened in the forums where they had to introduce their energy source and the pros and cons of this energy source to um, the whole community. And finally, the group collaboration where they, as a team, had to write their proposal with a concrete solution. So now let's get uh, back to the two research question. Uh, to answer the first research question, we introduced you for the for following experimental manipulation. First, we form random groups uh, right after the preparatory f phase. So we, uh, we uh, define the groups uh, that will later um, interact in their teams, but we uh, start with individual preparation and then the deliberation phase. In the control condition, we let the groups perform the liberation and collaboration within the small team. So we don't introduce the community level aspect to it. But in the experimental condition, the deliberation happens on the community level first before they go into their teams and actually um, collaborate on their final proposal. And uh, uh, the result that we got from our study is that teams that were exposed to the community level prep, uh, deliberation phase before going into their teams uh, demonstrate a better team performance judged on the uh, final grade on their team projects by um, a little more than three standard deviations. The second research question was whether um, transactive reasoning that is exhibited in the deliberation phase, in the community level de deliberation phase, um, allows us um, to form more effective teams when we use this information when, um, when grouping the students into teams. And in this uh, second experimental setup, we wanted to optimize the group formation um, based on the overall uh, based on, on the average transactivity um, exhibited in the deliberation phase. The two conditions were um, in, the, um, in the control group, we just formed random uh, groups by picking students from this, uh, these individual um, energy sources by random and grouping them in, in their teams, while the experimental conditioning uh, used an algorithm that maximized the average transactivity exhibited in the deliberation phase to form uh, teams that had the, um, that had the highest possible um, process um, performance. And we found that grouping uh, these students based on transactivity optimization is better than random grouping, again, by about three standard deviations. Um, okay, so I'm out of time, so I will not conclude my results, but show the URL again, because then we can have a more substantial conversation in the future. Thank you. It's lunchtime, but if you wanna... We can also talk <laughs> during lunch, if you prefer that. I always get the before lunch slots. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs>